Wednesday, whoever was banging downstairs has decided to knock it off. So now it's time for Talking Reds. <laughs> I'm here with uh, Craig Cannon, as always. Um, I'm going to be stepping in quite regularly for Gareth now, so uh, you better watch his back, you never know. <laughs> He's right, Mo. <laughs> I also thought I should give this an opportunity to answer some of the frequent questions that come up about me from fans, so I'd like to take this opportunity to tell everyone I've never been to Bel Air, I've never <laughs> DJed at Ibiza, although I have DJed at Glastonbury, and to my mum, yes, my razor is still broken. <laughs> I love this how he's, uh, how he's already talking about his fans. He's... Just, just selling it all, all straight away. I, I, I see you out there. I see what you say. Yeah, but anyway, we got yeah, good things. Good things were said about Mo last time he was on. So we thought we'd uh, we'd replace Gareth with him for uh, well, just for today, isn't it? So we'll see how um, it goes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, one thing that Gareth has been doing is he was at a local fans forum uh, held by the club before the Manchester City game. Uh, when he does eventually come back, he's going to go into it in more detail. But we wanted to just outline some of the main things that were raised in that. It was a good meeting in terms of a good mixture of people from within the club, people from within the fans forum. And the two main areas they wanted to talk about, one was covering empty seats in the ground, some of the less exciting games where there's sometimes as many as 2,000 empty seats, looking at a way of getting some youngsters in there, people from the local community. And the other big thing they were talking about is Liverpool's work within the community, specifically within the Anfield area, working on things as like open spaces for kids, uh, help for the elderly in the local area, and even things as, as interesting as uh, providing help with higher education for people within the North Liverpool area. So a really wide-ranging uh, topic structure and uh, as I say Gareth's going to go in more detail with it but uh, it's great to hear that the club are really taking an interest in these things isn't it? Exactly that's the first thing to say about it is that um, the very fact that these fan forums are happening and, and there are quite a few of them and they're covering a widespread uh, number of topics uh, to do with ticket and so um, yeah, Garth seemed like pretty positive about what was happening. We know that Tony Barrett was there, Peter Moore was there. There were five representatives in total from the club. Um, and then there were, I think it was 10 supporters. Um, but yeah, the, 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 on the, um, one of the things that we talked about was eradicating empty seats, like you said. And that's, that was kind of funny to read that because that's not something that we hear about talk no. too much. It's not something that's come into my head before that there are um, a number of empty seats because to us, it's you know it's difficult to get tickets. It's, uh, Anfield sold out. I think they, they used here it's uh, around 99.6% um, of tickets sold on average at each game throughout the season, but a fill rate on average of around 94%. So there's a lot of tickets, like you said, up to 2,000 tickets on some games, um, that are 2,000 seats. Sorry that although the tickets have been sold, they haven't been filled. So it's interesting to read about that and it's interesting that it's something that the club are working on and mm -hmm. working with fans to, um, to talk about and discuss and um, to, to work out what the best thing to do with these tickets and, and the best way to, uh, around this to prevent it happening in future seasons. Um, there was a couple of other things as well. Um, they discussed season ticket amnesty, uh, freeing up tickets for local uh, youngsters. Um, like you said, Mo, the, the local initiatives within Anfield, um, one of those was Red Neighbours. It's something that I've seen um, them do in person where they've surprised local kids from within the Anfield um, area um, with you know meeting footballers. I think it was Joe Gomez the night we were there um, and Jeannie Wijnaldum as well. So it's brilliant that they're doing this and they're thinking about the um, the locals as well. Um, and and yeah, like um, like Mo just said there, um, Garth was at the event, so it makes sense for him to talk in depth about um, his experience there. Um, and yeah, that'll be likely on Talking Reds tomorrow. So he will be back. Don't worry. <laughs> All you Gareth fans out there, you, you can you can do without him for one day. Now, going on to the club in more detail, there's a cracking article with, by Sam Williams on the website with uh, Bobby Firmino, where he talks about how he's connected to Liverpool, how he feels at home here, which is obviously great news to hear Definitely. when you think about what's happened recently. But with, he's talking more about his progression as a player, his attitude to working hard on the pitch, and how he feels connected not only within the team, 
Uh, Klopp himself described him as the engine of the team, which I think most of us who see the games would probably go along <laughs> with. Uh, engine's probably a really good word because he does the, not only the dirty work, it's kind of like you only really notice him when he's not there, I think. But in terms of the goals, a lot of times we as fans, we can get caught up in wanting a new sexy 20 goals a season striker to lead the line. Kind of like when um, Arsenal bought Lacazette, when it's looking for Aubameyang now. But the way that we play, having someone like Firmino who contributes so much more, is even better, I think, than having someone, the person who all you're looking for is goals. Because like I said, it makes the team tick. Definitely, he's, he's the vital cog in the machine um, of Jurgen Klopp's Liverpool. I think he is the most, player, uh, most important player in the team. You hear Klopp talk about him on a regular basis, about how important he is. Like I said, he's the engine, um, is, is Klopp's own words. And to see his progression at Anfield, when we signed him, it, he was that, he was, he was almost like, um, he was that sexy European player, sorry, uh, that sexy Brazilian player, but from the, from the European mm-hmm. mainland. Um, uh, coming in from Germany a little bit, unknown, uh, unknown to most of us, but um, he looked as if he, he, he had that sort of flair, but while he, he was hard work and he scored goals, and, and we've just seen that in abundance, and we've seen him progress season by season. I've got his goals here. Um, in, oh, it's actually, oh yeah, sorry, 17 goals in 31 games this season, and that's already um, 12 and 41 uh, last season, and 11 in 49 this first season. So you can just see that every single uh, every single year it's getting better and better. All while this Jurgen Klopp team gets better and better. Mm-hmm. So it's really really exciting. Some of the some of the quotes are really enjoyed as well. Um, uh, the, the the main one, and it just you know. We, we see it week in, week out. This, but uh, he said, uh, but I work on the basis that I'm never satisfied. I always want to do better, um, and the feeling that I'm never satisfied is my way of motivating myself to be the best that I can be. He also talked about his charisma, as you said, and why he's uh, uh, why he's a he's, crazy guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like we saw, we saw when we played Hoffenheim uh, last summer, where uh, he went back to his old club. Uh, they chanted his name, they applauded him as he uh, as he was taken off. Uh, but he was asked why, and he said, um, "He said I think it's down to my charisma. It's due to me as a person, um, uh, which I love. I just love how he knows that he's just got this yeah, charisma about he's, him, he's, both he's, on and off the pitch. He's a bums off seat kind of player. I mean, again, when you think about what we've just lost in Coutinho, there's been a lot of fear that maybe we don't have that as much of that anymore. Yeah. But not only the Manchester City performance, but him in general, the the the, the, the sending people for the echo, the <laughs> flinging the shirt around." the white teeth, the karate kicks. He's the guy who you want to look at. He's always the guy who's doing something. Every time I've been to Anfield, I felt like I'm drawn to just watching him. Not only how he works and moves on the pitch, but he's the kind of guy you want to have a beer with as well. I oh, think. he is. Imagine, imagine the beer. <laughs> oh, come to t- if you're watching, Bobby, I don't think you are, but just you know, come to Avenue HQ, have a beer with the Anfield rap. But, uh, yeah, He's just, he's the one player that if we lost him, I'd be devastated, more so than any that we've got, and, and even more so than Coutinho, uh, than Coutinho, I think, as well. Well, it sounds like the, the plan's already been made for not only a good, improved contract, but a long contract. Lifetime was the word the I Lifetime I was hers. And <laughs> when you think about it, he's not, never really the kind of character who's considered captain material but he could become one of those senior players who glues everyone else together and becomes a really important person as we develop our team and bring in more people. So, well in, Bobby. Let's keep it up, lad. Yeah. Now, one of the other players who... Well, we've had a lot of transfer talk over these last couple of days, most of it about who we might be bringing in, but here's a couple on who might be leaving. We spoke about Mignolet yesterday. We might speak about him again later, it depends on how much we're doing for time. But uh, we want to talk a little bit more about a forgotten man, Marco Gruic, who has uh, the quite wonderful uh, choice at the moment between uh, Tony Pulis and Neil Warnock. <laughs> yeah, oh God, Marco, yeah. He, he showed so much promise as well whenever we first signed him in that pre-season, didn't he? He, he did. He was scoring goals for fun. That the, Barcelona the, oh game, my word, where it look, was almost like the sky was the limit. Exactly, yeah, the loop and header, and that was, uh, I think we'd beaten them 4-0 that yep. day. It just looked as if he, although he was young, he might and he might need a few months to, to develop and, and sort of um, find out what England's all about. He, he looked as if, you know, within a season, he might be in and around the squad mm-hmm. at the very least, and I think, Injuries have curtailed that. I think he's been unlucky in that way. But he's still, when he's been brought into the under 23s, he still looked really good. Uh, and and uh, you know the fact that they they wanted 
take him out on loan, I think, just makes so much sense. Uh, and even in the championship as well, he's, he's got that gnarly streak yeah, about him, so I don't think exactly. there's, there'll be any problems down there. Um, he just needs game time. He needs game time in England as well, because mm. we've seen at times with previous signings where it's just not click for them straight away, and they've been shipped out to Portugal. Mar uh, Markovic yeah. is, the, is the prime example there, when they've been shipped out, and he's just it's been loan after loan, and we just don't want that to happen for Marco Grace. I get the feeling that the fact that Klopp wants him to stay within England means that he he, he believes in him, he yeah. wants to keep an eye on him. And I think one of the more important things, like you say, he's got that bit of devil in him. And when you look around our squad, there isn't that many people who have that. I mean, you'd say Emery Chan's yeah. one of them. But with that missing for so much of our season, it's interesting the fact that he hasn't been given a chance. But this is kind of Klopp's way. If you look at how say Chamberlain was brought in, slowly put in, Andrew Robertson at the beginning of the season, we were all wondering if he'd gone on, if he'd gone missing, if he'd been kidnapped. But now look at him, he's there, he's in several part of the squad. This is all about learning Klopp's way, learning to get into the team, get into the game, get into the league. And then once he trusts you, you will see the benefits. So I'm hoping this is just a temporary thing for Marco. Because I, I, I agree with you, I think he's got a lot of talent. I think he's someone who could do a good job for us in the future. And he's a big lad as well. Every, <laughs> every single time he came on at Anfield, or he played a couple of times in the uh, in the League Cup, I think, when he'd first signed. I remember against Spurs, he was just this towering midfielder, mm -hmm. wasn't he? Um, and and yeah, look, if he if he can do well in the Championship and maybe uh, impress in pre-season again, we can um, maybe we can sort of hope for a better future for Marco Grealish at Liverpool. But I just think. The team sort of progressed quicker than what he has, and, and we've talked about the reasons there. So, um, yeah, Londale makes all of the sense, I think. Fingers crossed for him. Yeah. Uh, some other potential moves out. Uh, Daniel Sturridge's name has been mentioned in dispatches again in link with Sevilla. Uh, he is apparently their number two option if they don't get <laughs> Meshi Batshuayi. So, uh, we're, we're now in the situation where we're hoping that Andy Carroll goes to Chelsea, so the Michi Batshuayi goes to Sevilla, so we get to keep storage. Oh. January's nuts, everybody. <laughs> like, I don't even think that commenting on most transfer stories at this time is even worth it, because it's so ridiculous, they change so quickly. When people are standing in front of Melwoods, holding scarves and shirts, that's when we can talk about them. Exactly, I, yeah. I, well, don't, actually, don't say that. We need to talk about it. talking rants every day. I know, I, 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 know, I know. know. I know what you mean. I think the... Uh, I just think Daniel Sturridge, it's, it's, it's every single transfer window with him as well. And it's funny how you talk about the knock-on effect of, you know, if one team buys this and one team buys that. I think uh, coming towards the end of the transfer window, we'll begin to see that a little bit more. And I think at the start, we did see that. Van Dijk moves, then Coutinho moves, Taco Sanchez, he looks if he's going to go. The knock-on effect of that then becomes Mkhitaryan going to Arsenal and then Arsenal. To, so it's going to be a really interesting um, last couple of weeks of the transfer window. And... Um, like you said, we talked about, um, I think you were on the gutter yesterday, yeah, weren't you? Indeed, it was a really yeah. interesting uh, one to listen to, talking about the goalkeeper situation um, and, and you know the possibilities of Liverpool, uh, of who Liverpool might bring in, whether it's now or whether it's in the summer. Um, it's definitely worth uh, listening to that. It's on top there at the moment. The gutter is always great. I mean, Rob it's, Goodman is a force of nature, isn't he? He comes into his it. element every January and every transfer time. So there's a lot of interesting things being spoken about there but in terms of who's really going where i'm not really going to get too up or too down you just kind of kind of watch it see it develop and then wait until the last week that's when the real fun's going to start i think definitely we'll, we'll have a look at the papers now will we yeah speaking of real fun let's look at the papers so in the papers today, there's one story that's dominating in pretty much all of them. Uh, VAR's finally done something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go. Um, the Mirror had a pretty good uh, pun. What was it? Kelly Vision history. Kelly Vision history. Yep. Basically, what happened was there was an incident in the Leicester Fleetwood FA Cup replay. Kelechi Iheanacho scored a goal. It was disallowed for offside. John Moss then decided there was a natural break in play. We might as well check to see if it was onside. Turns out it was onside, goal given, everyone happy. And I think it showed really how at its best, this thing is not gonna harm football. It's not gonna get in the way of football. It's just gonna help people. It's gonna make us get more decisions right. It's not about every little thing being checked. It's about when there's a potential howler, we rectify it. I think that's the I think that's the worry from fans is that 
it might take the fun out of whether it's a goal like that. Now, obviously, the goal was ruled, it was ruled offside, so it's great that they, they were able to um, you know, correct the decision, and that's brilliant. I think what fans are worried about is that a goal goes in, you celebrate in the stands, then it's you know it's stopped. The ref has a look. I think it was in a was it in a Aroma game um, recently where they did it. It took ages. It was like a last minute winner or whatever. Um, and it took ages and then it almost takes the fun out of the goal because you saw then it was slightly muted celebrations yeah, when, yeah. Uh, when the goal was given. I think it also didn't help that they weren't even really sure what was going on because he did the, you know, he did the, the VAR thing and, and, and it was a bit like, uh, well, what does that mean? Yeah. Have they won? Have they? You could see players asking him. Yeah. Um, so it's just as long as it doesn't start to slow uh, things down, it's as long as it's not used too often, I suppose. As with all of these things, the application is key. I think in terms of people getting used to how it works, that's just going to come with time. I mean, if you look at cricket and how it's done there, the actual decision in itself becomes an event. You get a little bit of the crowd going, ooh, while you're waiting. <laughs> so in terms of a spectacle or, or anything like that, you can add to it as much as it can potentially detract from it. I just think that we're in a situation now where we have the technology to do these things and if we're going to be sitting at home analysing, freeze framing and then slating these referees who don't have this opportunity, let's give them this opportunity. I mean, essentially, we all want more right decisions, don't we? Yeah, I suppose. Um, I would say as long as it doesn't happen to your own team, and that's, <laughs> you know, football, football fans are always biased, but as long as it ha doesn't happen to your own team, I think, I think football fans just like a discussion, don't they? And they like to be able, they like that um, the debate between whether a, a decision is correct, whether it's incorrect. Uh, they, they get to talk about it straight in the pub straight after the game. I think that's one thing. And I think, God, you're talking about making it a, a, a spectacle as you wait, but imagine it's a massive goal in a, in a European tie and. Think, think of the nerves, think of the, the nerves in that two minutes of waiting to, to find out whether but, it's actually but, but a goal or not. But that happens anyway. I mean, yeah. if you think about nerves in a game or, or think about a penalty shootout where you have nerves and the build up and it can be, it's all about how it's done. It's all about how it's used, I think. It's one of those things, it's not perfect, it's going to have its kinks. People like everything that comes in, they're going to try and disrupt it, they're going to try and um, use it to their own advantage. I think as long as we can stop that, we, all we don't want is players constantly harassing the referee, asking him to do that. But in terms of the debate angle, it's still a lot of it is going to be down to the referee's subjective thoughts. Yeah. So there's still going to be room for leeway. It's still not going to be definitive. Yeah. So in that way, they're still going to have your debates. We're going to get more bad decisions taken away from the game. I, th I think everyone can be happy. Now, speaking of people who won't be happy, uh, any Geordies who are listening to us here, you might want to cover your ears for this one. I feel sorry for them, you know. I do. Unfortunately, uh, Ashley is saying now, no deal. The, the mooted takeover, the much mooted takeover by Amanda Slavely and PCP Holdings now looks like it's off. Um, Ashley's not really held back either in, in his assessment of why it's been going off. He said that the talk was a waste of time. He's saying that they've had no bids and it wasn't fair on the Newcastle fans to leave this indecision up in the air any longer. Now, as you say, both myself and Craig, we do have a bit of a spot spot for Newcastle. Craig used to live up in the city and I've got good friends who are Geordies. And it's a real shame because it's a club and a city that deserves to have a little bit of positivity after a year, well, a decade of Mike Ashley. Yeah, they've had a hard time, haven't they? Um... I think, the, well, first and foremost, we've all got a soft spot for Rafa Benitez as well. Yeah, there's and, a Rafa angle too. Um, you know, I loved the fact that he stayed with them even when they were relegated. Um, I loved how the Newcastle fans have got behind them, how they, they try and create an atmosphere even when things aren't as positive as they maybe should up there. Um, I saw, I was at Newcastle away, I saw that and, and the atmosphere was brilliant. Um, and, and yeah, just for, for Benitez as well, uh, when I heard about the possible takeover, I was excited for him because I thought, you know, with a little bit of money to spend, he could do, he could, he could work wonders up there, especially with those fans behind him. And I don't think they've been behind a manager uh, as they have with Benitez in a long time, no. maybe since Bobby Robson or Kevin Keegan. Um, so it looked as if there was finally going to be a positive ending to the, to the whole, um, the whole Ashley thing. And you know, 
I've seen I've seen the hatred of him um, up there. Well, I've been, I used to go to a few games when I went up whenever I lived up there. And um, but at the end of the day, Ashley's a businessman. Um, and I remember watching an interview. I think it was just in the summer. Um, I think it was with Sky Sports as well, where he talked about well, if a you know if a, a bid come in. He would have a look at it, and he would sell the club if it meant, you know, if it was a good thing mm -hmm. for the for the club, and it meant the club could move forward. Because he he admitted he just didn't have the funds. And um, again, when you go back to Benitez and what he's done, he's managed to bring them up, and he's managed to bring them up uh, by well balancing books in terms of selling some of their best players, which they had to when they went down, um, and and bringing in players that would do the job, um, get them up in the championship at the first hurdle, which they did. It's just to spend them, they just haven't, that's why I feel sorry for them. Everyone just... can see that Newcastle are stretched super thin. Yeah. They've done a fantastic job to get to where they are, get into contention of staying in the league. But to get to that extra step, you can feel like they do need investment. Now, there's been talk that Mike Ashley's been holding off on investments while this has happened. So maybe now he knows it's not happening. He realises that he has to go out there and try to keep them in the league. But if they're thinking of trying to attract future people to come in and take over the club. If they get relegated or if they're in relegation trouble for the most of the season, they're not the most attractive person to no. buyers. Now, there's also been rumours that a bid did go in, according to people from Stavely's camp, but it was around 250 million as opposed to the 300 million mooted. So I don't know whether or not that means that there's more wriggle room or someone else is going to come in at a higher price. I'd like to give you Geordies out there a little bit of hope, but <laughs> at the moment, it's looking like if, if, if there's no deal and there's no future, uh, except Mike Ashley, then there might also be no Rafa Benitez. Yeah, they're only three points um, ahead of the relegation zone as well. We've already seen him linked with, uh, with some sides. I think he was linked with the Stoke job as well. Um, I don't know why he would have done that anyway. But, He's going to um, be linked with every job that comes up now. He is, yeah. Um, and he's managed to, even though they were relegated, he's managed to sort of reaffirm how good a manager he is, mm -hmm. being able to uh, keep them above relegation. And, and I, I just hope he stays up, just even for Rafa Benitez, I hope he stays up this season. Well, uh, Neil Atkinson's uh, shout of him becoming potentially the next Arsenal manager just got a little bit quicker. That's a big shout, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> OK, so uh, in dispatches now, we've got some exciting things happening from within the world of the Anfield rap. And um, one of the most exciting things is uh, we're going back out on tour, Craig. Yeah, they're going to um, we're going to Stockholm on Friday the 9th of February and then Norway on the Sunday night. Um, Liverpool are playing Southampton that weekend, so at the Norway gig they're going to do a live post-match show um, and then it's all of the usual antics. Um, if you are in either of those countries and, and you want to come to the time at a saw live show, um, all you have to do is visit uh, www.theanfieldrap.com forward slash taw live. Um, tickets are free, all you need to do is sign up to Redsbet. You don't have to use the account, you don't have to spend any money. Um, you simply need a username uh, and then to email it to um, the email address that's on that page. Um, so that's www.theanfieldrap.com forward slash taw live. Easy for you to say. <laughs> took a lot of concentration. <laughs> now, anyone who's seen any of the videos or heard any of the shows from our for Rap Live stuff, it's, it's a fantastic way to watch the games. <laughs> I mean, we, we've done a few of them from inside this very building and it can get a bit rowdy at times, but essentially it's one of those things where we all reaffirm why we love our club and hopefully get to celebrate a win and you get to get a little bit closer to some of us who make what it is that is the Anfield Rap possible. So, yeah, if you're in Norway or if you're in Stockholm, come down and see Definitely. us. And in terms of the shows we've got coming out today, there's a couple of new ones. There's another what we call history from the 0506 season, which memory serves was a pretty good season overall, ended with an FA Cup, so lots of good memories to listen to on that one. And there's another wild cards coming out. Now, for those of you who don't know the format of wild cards, what it is, is that we give you the chance to direct the topic of conversation. So three categories, Liverpool past, Liverpool present, and then a randomer. The questions will go up on Twitter, so they might even be up there. Oh no, we've recorded the show. Yeah, they were so. up last night. They were up last, up last week, so you can, uh, you, you can search back on our Twitter to find those. Um, 
Uh, yeah, so if you want to if you want to listen to them, if you want to hear any of the um, the post match show was really popular after the City game, of course. Of course. Uh, any of our transfer shows, the gutter. Um, if we if there are any signings made in this transfer, hopefully there are. We'll be reacting those immediately. You should be able to get those reaction specials as well, and all of the old podcasts, all of the old interviews. Um, all you have to do is go to Anfield at uh, theanfieldrap.com forward slash subscribe, um, and yeah, five pounds a month. It's all good. You know it is. See you tomorrow.